If you would, go ahead and find in your Bibles tonight, Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1. And uh, when you find that, you can stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Ezra chapter 1, we're going to read the first five verses. If you've got that, say amen. 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 And this is what it says. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom And put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem." And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods, and with the beast beside the freewill offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites and all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem." I want you to notice verse 1. It says, The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Down in verse 3 it says, Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem. And then in verse 5 it says, Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah, and Benjamin, and the priests, and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. I want to use a title, uh, title of the message tonight is, It's Time to Come Home. It's time to come home. You may be seated. Now, the book of Ezra opens with the end of what is known as the Babylonian captivity. Now, to give you a little bit of history there, just to bring everybody up to speed on that, um, Israel really had known its glory days during the reign of David and King Solomon. And after that, there was a fragmentation of the kingdom, and um, they really, God's people really began to turn to idols and to neglect the commandments of God. They began to get away from the things that God Uh, had spoken. It was really over the course of about 400 years, there was a steady decline that was happening. And God had sent prophets to them over and over again to warn them, to tell them to turn from their idolatry and to return to the living God. And at times there were small reprieves. There were, there were times where for a little bit they would, they would return and do what they were supposed to do. But ultimately they continued in their sins and they hardened their hearts And as a result, God brought judgment. He allowed the Babylonians to come down and to bring judgment on them. The northern kingdom went first and then the southern kingdom later. And so we have here, uh, the Babylonians came and they destroyed their home and they took them away captive 70 years. Now Jeremiah prophesied about this in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11 and 12. Let me read that real quick. And this whole land shall be desolate and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. And that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. So when we come to this point, Uh, When we open the book of Ezra, we're coming to the end of the 70 years. Is where we're at in time. In in time, uh, we're coming to the end of the seventy years, and Jerusalem has been laid waste. The land is desolate. The temple is destroyed, and the Jews have been in bondage seventy years. But the amazing thing, as we started to read, God is beginning to move. 
Did you notice when we started reading the first part of this scripture, God is beginning to move and things are about to change for the people of God. Now, even though God was chastening his people, God had not forgotten his people. How many know that God doesn't forget his people? Though he was chastening them, yet God had not forgotten them and God was not going to leave them where they were. God was going to bring his people home, just like he said. Now, Jeremiah also said this in Jeremiah 29, verse 10. He said this, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. So Jeremiah prophesied that the 70 years would come, but he also said when the 70 years was over, God was going to bring his people home out of that land of bondage. Now, before we go any further, I want to give you a snapshot of the people in captivity. The people in captivity. I want, to, I want to take just a moment to give you a snapshot of what it looks like to see these people in captivity. Now, we're going to come back to the book of Ezra, but you can turn over to Psalm 137 just for a moment, and we're going to look at a few things. We're going to see a nation in a strange land is what we're about to look at. We're going to see a nation that's in a strange land. Psalm 137. Listen to what it says. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Now, not much is said about the history of these people while they're in captivity. Um, you have... Jeremiah, he didn't go with the captives into Babylon. You had Ezekiel, he prophesied uh, in Babylon, but he was mainly talking about his visions and things that he was seeing. And then you had Daniel, but he was in the court prophesying to the rulers. So there's not a whole lot of information other than the prophecies that were given about their time in bondage and in captivity. But we come to Psalm 137, and it actually is a uh, historical, historical psalm, and it gives us a picture of these people in Babylon. And we see in that first verse, we see a nation in a strange land. They say, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, we wept when we remembered Zion. See, what had happened was sin had brought these people into a strange land. You know, this was not the place that God had purposed for these people. This was not the place of blessing that God had made for these people. This is not where God intended for these people to be, yet sin had had brought them to a place of ruin. Sin had brought them to a place of bondage, and these are God's people. But now we see that they're in sorrow. They're in a place that they did not want to be. Sin will always bring you to a strange land. The number of times that I've heard people say that have uh, had something happen in their life, and, and, and you hear them say, I, I never thought that I would be in this place. Or you're, you'll hear him say, I, I never thought that this would happen to me, but here I am. And that was the tone of these people over in Babylon. They, perhaps they were sitting by the rivers of Babylon in this strange land, and they were saying, I, I never thought that it would come to this. I, I heard the warnings of, of the people of God. I, I heard what they were saying. I, I heard the things that the prophet said, but I didn't think that I would be in this place, but, but here I am now in a strange land. And, and there was, there was a, a weeping inside of them that says this, this place is not where I ever in, intended to be. And the truth is, in any one of us, if we're not staying near to God, that can happen in any one of us. We can yield to temptation, and someday we may find ourselves in a strange land, in a place we didn't expect to be, saying, I didn't think that this could ever happen to me. And now I want you to notice also that this strange land is a place of despair. Did you notice that? It says, we sat down, we wept when we remembered Zion. So they were overwhelmed, really, in this place. Just like he was talking about this morning, those that sat in darkness. They just come to the point that they're overwhelmed. They've all but lost hope. They, they've all but, they, they don't know uh, what they're going to do from, from day to day. And they're, they're just sitting there, uh, wasting away is what it feels like as you read 
reading this passage. They, they feel like uh, this is just where I am, and, and, and I, I might as well just sit down and give up. And there was a sense of hopelessness about them. How could we end up here? How could we be in this place? And not only that, but they had a longing for home. They had a longing for home. It, it says, we wept when we remembered Zion. Now, I, I think something, when we read that, I think there was certainly a, a great amount of pain that they felt as they were there because of where they were. But I think the greater pain that they felt was the memories of where they once were, the memory of, of the land that they once lived in, the memories of the blessings of God that they once knew, the place of joy that they once felt, the place of blessings that they once were at. I think that was really what grieved them. And when they thought about their home, they thought about a Zion that it caused them to weep inside, not just because of where they are, but oh, how they long to be back to their home, back to that place. And we're seeing a snapshot of a strange land. We're seeing a people in a strange land. And not only that, but they lost their song in the strange land. Look at verse 2 of Psalm 137. It says, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. They lost their song. They lost their desire to sing. They, they lost their inspiration. They're, they're here in this place. They just, they just didn't seem to have anything to sing about anymore. They, just, they couldn't find it in them to sing anymore. And so they, they said, well, I have nothing to sing about, and I'm in this strange place, and, and, uh, uh, and, and I don't know what to do. So they said, well, I'm just going to put my instrument up. I'm just going to hang it up because there's no point in me even doing anything with it anymore. And so it says they hung their harps in the willow. They, they, they couldn't find the will to play anymore. And not only that, but their captors were their continual tormentors. Look at verse 3. For there are they that carried us away, captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth or joy, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. So they didn't have a will to sing. They're in a strange land. They're in a, a place they didn't expect to, to be. And on top of that, the very ones that had carried them away captive, they say, hey, we heard how you guys love to sing. We heard how you used to go to your temple and you would all come together and you'd sing God's praises about how great God was and about all the wonderful things and all the wonderful works of God. And they said, hey, how about you sing us one of those songs? And what they were doing, they were mocking them. They were saying, go ahead and sing us one of those songs. Where's your God now? Where is he now? Go ahead and sing. sing. Make sure you sing it real happy. We want, we want a foot tapper. Go ahead and sing that song. And they were mocking him. They said, I want you to sing it just like you're back home, even though their home was destroyed and their temple was laid waste. And so they simply could not and they would not sing in the strange land. Look at their question in verse 4. They say, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Now, the temple was an essential part of their worship. It was an essential part of their praise. And, and, and they're, they're asking this question. They're saying simply, I, I can't and I won't sing the Lord's song because the temple for which I went to sing these songs is gone. And the land to which I'm from, the Lord's place, it, it's gone. It's destroyed. And so, no, I'm not going to sing this song and I simply can't because I go to the house of the Lord to sing and the house of the Lord is gone. The house of the Lord is gone. And they say, I, I, I won't sing. I'm not going to, to degrade the memory of my home and of the temple. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to sing these songs for you. There was a difference, however, between the Jewish exiles that we see, and they say we can't sing, and the Christian today. Because the Christian can sing in any circumstance. The Christian can lift up their voice and sing praise to God in a strange land. In fact, this world is not our home and we're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. We can sing in this strange land. 
Why? Because the Spirit of God lives inside of us. Wherever we are, we may be like Paul and Silas in the prison cell, and yet we can at midnight begin to pray and sing praises to God, and the Lord will hear us. We may have sinned against God, and there's a separation, and it's brought us to a strange land, but oh, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and we come to him at once, and he will wash our sins away, and we can sing again. Hallelujah. We can sing again. They made a pledge to God in this strange land. These people did. Again, we're taking just a snapshot. I want you to see this before we move on. Look at verses five and six of this same psalm. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If, if I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Now, listen, he says, if I forget thee, if I do not remember thee, if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. What he was saying, there is a danger of embracing the bondage and forgetting about Jerusalem. Now, let me say this, because some of you might remember that Jeremiah told him when you go into exile, build houses, get married, have families, do all of these things, because they were going to be there for a long time. They, you're going to be there 70 years, make the best of it, basically, Jeremiah was saying. But God also said, at the end of 70 years, I'm going to bring you home. So there was going to be a long time that they're there, and they had to make the best of it while they're there, but God was going to bring them back to their, their home. And, and so he's saying here, there's a danger of me embracing this place of bondage. There's a danger of me settling for something less than God has. There's a danger of me just getting used to where I am and saying, well, this is just going to be how it always is, and there's nothing I can do about it, so I might as well just get used to it and replace my former joys that I used to know with new joys and just settle for Babylon. And he's saying, if that happens, I want to forget how to play my instrument, and I want my tongue to stick to my mouth where I can never sing again if I regard anything else as better than my home. Nothing short of restoration to his home would do. He's saying, I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle for less than what God has. There's so many people today, I think, that are bound in sin and, 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 and difficulties, and they've just decided, I'm just going to settle. I, I can't break free. This is, just, this is where I am. It's just the way that it is, so I'm just going to settle and, and just, just let it be this way. But God has so much more. God has so much more. If you're willing to let him bring you out of that place, God has so much more for those people that are willing to let him move. Hallelujah. And so they're in this strange land. Their joy is gone. And really in that psalm, it's actually, uh, at the end of it, it's an, what they call an imprecatory psalm in which a curse is placed upon those who had come and done the evil to them. They said, God, come and judge these people who have done so wickedly to us. They were grieving. There was a severe grief that had stricken them. They seen their families killed in front of them violently. They were taken away violently. Their cities burned, and there was something in them that said, oh, God, bring justice to this situation. I want you to know that there is a day where God is going to judge the world in righteousness. And all the wickedness that's been done in this world, Jesus Christ is going to set it in order. God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to think about this. God was not done with these people. I think you've seen that in Scripture here. God is not done with these people. In fact, they're going to sing again. They lost their song in Zion. They lost their song in Babylon, rather. But they're going to sing again. I don't know whether this particular psalmist in, in 137, I don't know whether he was one of those who had committed all the evils or if he was one of the faithful remnant that had been carried away with him in the process. I don't know where he stood with things. But in any event, he was there and he was one of God's people. And when you're one of God's people, you have hope. 
And this man by the rivers of Babylon who was weeping, who was grieving, who was sorrowing, who was desiring, and really in a spirit of repentance saying, if, if, I, if I choose anything else over, over Jerusalem, uh, Lord, don't let it be so. That really, that was a spirit of repentance in his heart saying, I choose nothing but to be restored. And, and so... Uh, I don't know what the condition of this man was prior to this, but, but in, either, in any event, he's God's people, and, and God's going to bring them out. And, and you may have brought ruin on your life. You may have brought ruin, but God can reconcile you. God can bring the reconciliation. God can bring the restoration. God can move in your situation. You might have to endure the consequences of the sin. But let me tell you, God is not done with you just because you have to put up with the consequences of your sin. It doesn't mean that God casts you off and forgets you. It doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. God still can move in your life. And you can sing again. Hallelujah. Sometime back, I thought of this when I read this psalm a few years ago, really. And understand, this isn't in the scriptures, but I thought about these harps. It says they hung them in the willows down by the rivers of Babylon. And they hung these harps in the willows. And of course, they've given up. They've sat down. And, and you can see maybe all these singers that, that are there, and, they, and they've hung their instruments up in the willows. And I thought about maybe from time to time, that a breeze would blow through. And those harps would begin to clang against the trees. Or maybe they would, you know, they would, they would begin to clang against the trees or maybe smash against another one of those harps and there would be sounds and there was kind of that ambient noise of the strings, you know, that was happening as the breeze would begin to blow through there. And I couldn't help but think maybe from time to time as, they, as the breeze would blow through and you could hear the sounds of those harps clanging in the wind, maybe it would sound like wind chimes on a porch, you know, on a, on a summer night when they blow through and you can hear the jangling of the wind chimes. And I thought maybe from time to time as those harps were hanging in the willows, God would send a gentle breeze and the harps would begin to clang against one another and the ambient sounds of those strings and God was saying in a small, still voice, you will sing again. He was saying, you will sing again. It may not be today, but you will sing again because I have not forgotten you. Hallelujah. He was saying, it's not over. You found yourself somewhere you didn't want to be, but it's not over. You found yourself in despair, but it's not over. You found yourself in a circumstance that's caused you to lose your song. It, it may be, it maybe it's something that wasn't sin. Maybe it was even something, a tragedy in your life, and it's caused you to lose your song. Maybe there's something that's happened to you, and it's caused you to lose your song, and you've given up in despair. But I want you to know the breeze of God is blowing in this place tonight and he's saying you will sing again it may not be tonight but God has not forgotten you and you will sing again hallelujah you may have to go through it Israel went through 70 years they went through 70 years God's people went through 70 years but with God you can go through it and by his grace you will sing again that's a beautiful thought so now it's time to come home. It's time to come home. The Lord began speaking to me that this earlier this week. It's time to come home. It's time to come home. Ezra, Ezra, this was a fresh start for God's people. This was a fresh start. This was a new beginning for God's people, and it was time to come home. The 70 years are over. The 70 years are over and God is beginning to call his people home and God is beginning to stir and saying it's time to come home. It's time to come back to the place where you belong. I know you've been gone for a long time, but, but Babylon has fallen. There's a new king that I put up into place, and I'm stirring his heart because I'm going to bring you home just like I told you I would do. He's, he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stir this king. The Bible says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. 
You realize that, that God puts them up and God takes them down. And God took Babylon out and in came Persia and here comes Cyrus. And God was going to stir Cyrus. Now, Cyrus is a, a, an incredible character because actually Isaiah called him by name and told us exactly what he would do about 150 years before he did it. Let me read that for you. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. That saith of Cyrus, he wasn't born yet, by the way, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. About 150 years beforehand, Isaiah prophesied exactly that would happen. Now let's see what Cyrus did. Back to our text verse, Ezra chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the 70 years are over, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Just exactly like Isaiah said by the word of the Lord. And amazingly, not only that, he, he sends this proclamation for the people to return. He says, you can return, and, and they're going to build the house of the Lord, but that also means they can go back home. Because they can go build the house of the Lord, that means you can go back to your home. You can go back to the land of promise. You can go back to the land of blessing. And it's been a long time, but God is beginning to move. God is beginning to stir and not only that, all the, all the, uh, all the things that, that Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, Cyrus sends those back too. Says, you're going to need these when you build that temple. Not only did he stir the heart of the king, but he stirred the heart of the people to return. He stirred the heart of the people to return. Now, I want you to know something. The, the people were listening for the voice of God. These people were listening for the voice of God. God is starting to move. He, he, first of all, he stirs the heart of the king. And then he opens a door that's been closed for 70 years. You realize that. God opens a door. And he allows them to go home. And, and the question comes out, who is there that's willing to go? Cyrus sends that question. He says, he sends out the word. God's told me to build the house. Who of his people are willing to go and build the house? You know, there were some people listening for that. There were some people listening for that call. And the same call, I believe, is going out today. God is saying, who is willing to go to build the house of the Lord? Who is willing to go out and begin to do the work of the Lord? Who is willing to go out and do the things that I am enabling you to do? Who is willing to go out and serve me and to do the things that I've called you to do? The same call is going out today, but are we listening? Are we willing to go and build when the call comes? When God says it's time to go home and it's time to build, are we willing to hear the voice of the Lord? Are we willing to hear his voice? But look at verse 5 of chapter 1 of Ezra. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. God had stirred their spirit. Have you ever had God stir you for something? It's, it, it's like there's, there's nothing else I can do but that one thing that God is stirring you to do. I've got to do it. And I was praying this afternoon that God stir a people because I believe that God is calling some people to come home. I believe God is calling some people, if they're willing to hear the voice of God, to return to the work of God. 
to return to the things of God, to return, to begin to go home, to begin to build. I, I believe God is calling, and I say, oh, God, stir our hearts that we're willing to hear your voice when you call. Stir our hearts that we're willing to hear it when you call. See, there were some that went, but there were others that stayed, and they supported the work. They, they gave to the work. They, they did things to encourage the work, but they stayed behind. And I wonder, why, why did they stay behind? Why, why didn't they go to rebuild the house of the Lord when the voice of the Lord was calling clearly saying, it's time to come home? Why did they stay? Had they settled in Babylon? Had they decided that this was just the place I would rather be? Did they like their new job that they had? Did they like their new home that they built? Had they got comfortable in that place and they said, you know what, working for God was nice, but living in the world is better. I think I'll just stay right here and uh, cheer you on from a distance were they willing no some stayed home some probably had very good reasons to stay home maybe elderly maybe maybe had uh, older parents or different things there's any number of circumstances but but there were probably some that just said well I think I've just kind of got comfortable here I'll just stay here and they didn't come to the work of the Lord so many returned but many stayed home That first return happened under Zerubbabel, and there was about 50,000 people that went back. You see that in chapter 2 of Ezra. About 50,000 people went back. But there was countless number that stayed where they were. And over time, there was another, um, they, they went back in waves, really. But this first one is under Zerubbabel to build the temple. But I, I said all that to say this, it's, it's time to come home. God was saying, it, God was saying to his people, you, you've been away long enough. I've chastened you, I've, I've dealt with you, and I've told you that I would bring you back. And God was saying, if you're willing to come home, I'm willing to bring you home. If you're willing to come back to your home, I'm calling I'm calling, I'm stirring. I've opened every door. I've did the impossible that you can't do. And he's saying, he's saying, come home. Come home. I'm going to enable you to build. I'm going to able, I'm going to enable you to bring restoration to ruin. The rubble that's laying there, I'm going to enable you to go back and to rebuild the places that that people thought would never be rebuilt. I'm going to enable you to go back. And he's saying, if you're willing, I'll rebuild. I've stirred the king. I've opened the door. Will you allow me to stir you? Will you allow me to stir you to go to the work of the Lord? And I want to tell you this, that the people that went home, they came home to revival. The people that came home They didn't stay in Babylon. The people that said, I choose you, Lord. I choose the voice of God. I choose the purposes of God. I choose you over everything else. I know it's going to be a hard task. I know it's going to be difficult, but God, I choose you. I hear your voice, and I'm coming. If you're going to take me, I'm coming, Lord. And these people, they came home to revival. Look at chapter 3, and this is where we're going to round out our message. You can pin it down right there. I want you to notice, first of all, that they had a revival of fellowship and worship. Look at verse 1. When the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. David Guzik gave a a good note, something that is interesting about this. He said, this was an important month on the spiritual calendar of Israel. In the seventh month, they celebrated the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Trumpets, and the Feast of Tabernacles. They were coming home just in time. They were coming home just in time to get back to business with God. And it says that they, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. It had been years since that had happened. 
where the people came together as one. They came back home to Jerusalem. The people of God were gathering back together at that place where they used to gather together. Yeah, it was rubble and it was heaps and it was a mess, but God was doing something beautiful that day in that he was bringing them home to revival. He was bringing them home to a revival of fellowship and worship. These people that have been scattered, they're coming together as one man. I think about on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord, and that's when the fire fell, and the Spirit of God began to blow across that place, and in the same way, they came together as one man to that place, and they said, we're coming home to revival because God's going to let us sing again. Oh, that the church would come together again as one man and one mind and one accord for the purpose of God, having been stirred up by the Spirit of God, that we would come together and let God begin to do a work in us. Let God begin to rebuild the rubble. Let God begin to rebuild the heaps. Oh, that we would have a revival of worship and fellowship in the house of the Lord. Oh, God, they came together as one man to Jerusalem. They came together to make this happen. Not only that, they came home to a revival of the word of God. Look at verse 2. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, the, spy, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon. Listen as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. How did they know to build the altar? The word of God. They looked to the word of God. When they came home, they came home as one man. They came home to that place. And they all got together in Jerusalem and they said, now what do we do? Many of these had never been there. Many of these people have been born in captivity. They've never seen this before. We're here. Oh, God stirred us up to be here. Now what do we do? And they say, I'll tell you what you do. You open the book, and you see what God says you need to do. And so they came home, and they needed guidance. But the Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so they needed instruction, and they needed understanding, and they needed help to know what to do. And so they opened the book, and they began to see what the word of God says. And they had a revival of the word of God. Amen. Every generation needs a revival of the word of God. I believe with all my heart right now, this generation needs a revival of the word of God. There may be masses of people standing around that God has stirred up, and they're saying, now what do we do? And they need a place where you have a pastor that teaches the word of God, where they can come in and find out, what does the book say I need to do? What do I need to do? I'm here, but I don't know what to do. And they say, look to the word of God. And you begin to open the word of God. And when they did, they begin to see incredible things. But they would never know it without looking to the revelation of God to man. And we need a revival of the word of God. They came home to a revival of repentance. A revival of repentance. Look again there at verse 2. It says, they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon. As it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people in those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. There was a revival of repentance. A revival of repentance. They looked to the word of God, and what they found out is that God is holy and righteous. They found out that they had disobeyed God, and that's why they're being judged for where they are. That's why they've been in captivity 70 years, because they sinned against God. They disobeyed the commandments of God, and they've seen the soul that sinners shall die, and they see that the, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And so what do they do? They say, we've got to get the altar back on its foundations. We've got to have a revival of the altar. We've got to get the altar functioning again. We've got to start making sacrifices for atonement. We've got to come back to the altar. And so they found the old place where the altar used to sit. 
They dug through the rubble and they found the place. This is where the altar was. And they set it upon the foundations, upon its bases where it was. And they began to offer sacrifice. And it was a revival of repentance. God, we've sinned against you. We've been in captivity because of the wickedness that we've done. But today, we come to you in humble repentance. Oh, God, if you'll receive us, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And they begin to offer the sacrifice. I want you to know that today we have an altar too. We have an altar, and it's been set upon its ancient foundation, slain from the foundations of the world. The Lamb of God was slain at the cross of Calvary, and without it, we have no forgiveness. Without it, we have no redemption. Without it, we have no hope of life. But through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can have everlasting life. We need a revival of repentance in the land. We need a revival where we come back to the altar, where we come back to the cross, where we come back to the place where Jesus offered one sacrifice for sin forever. He said it is finished. He said the debt has been paid and it's time to come back to a revival of the word of God, to a revival of the altar, to come back to the cross. He was at the cross. At the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. If you want to know what true joy and freedom is, today's the day to come back to the altar. To come back to the altar, we need a revival of repentance. Are you still with me? I'm going to go through these next couple sections kind of quicker, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. But God has really been speaking this to me. I believe, I believe God's stirring right now. When we're in our services this morning, there was a stirring that was happening. I've been in church my whole life. I've seen the tides come and go, if you, would, if, if you want to say it like that. And it seems like sometimes there's times where God begins to really stir his people for something. And I just pray if, if God is speaking, that we hear what he's saying. Not just to have a feel good for a moment, but really hear what God is saying. When he begins to speak, it brings me to the next point that they had a revival of obedience to God. A revival of obedience to God. They came home to revival. We're called to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Look at verses 4 through 6. I just want you to see how they become obedient. We're not going to pick all this stuff apart, but I just want you to see their obedience to the things of God. Watch this. They kept also the feast of tabernacles as it is written. And offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. And afterward offered the continual burnt offerings both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated. And of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month begin they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. Did you see how they had become obedient? There's a lot of stuff in there. And they were being meticulous to make sure that they were doing everything as it was written. Lord, we want to follow you just exactly. This was a revival of obedience. It comes after repentance. When you repent before God, now you have a, a, a heart that's right towards God where God has granted you repentance and now you say, God, I want to do what you have commanded me to do. It causes you to desire to do those things and they're having a revival there. Not only that, they have a revival of service to God. Look at verses seven and eight. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and to them of Tyre to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. They're getting everything ready to build the temple is what's happening there. 
They're gathering their supplies. Now in the second, verse eight, now in the second year of, his, of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of their brethren, and the priests, and the Levites, and all they that were come out of captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. So God was stirring them up to a revival of obedience and then service. So they got right with God. They found out what the word of God says. They realized that they weren't right with God and we had better get right with God. They set the altar up. They got right with God. Then they began to become obedient to God. And now they're going to begin to serve God to do the thing that he called them to do. That's what's happening in these verses. I know there's a lot of information there. That's why I just, I just wanted to skim through it so you can see that because we're getting to the good stuff here in just a moment. Hang with me. Don't give up on me. We're going to get to the good stuff. Because here's the thing. They, they got everything together. They, they, they had all the finances they've been collecting. They've come back to the land. They've, they've got things in order. They're getting things in order. They're collecting the supplies. God has stirred them up. It's not been an easy process, mind you. I can't imagine what they came back to, what they were looking at when they got there, how piles of stuff everywhere. Now they've got to sort through and they've got to rebuild. It's not an easy process what they were coming back to do. And, you know, a lot of times it never is an easy process when we're coming to do uh, an undertaking. But God gives us the strength to do it. And God is giving them the strength to do it. And what happens is when they get back together and they all come back together and, they're, and there's one mind and one accord and they begin to obey God and they begin to look to the word, they begin to serve God. And what happens is the people are, are going to get their song back. They still hadn't got their song back from way back there in Babylon. It's gone. They lost it. But they're going to get their song back. Let's look again at verses 9 through 11. Watch this. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad with their sons, their brethren, the Levites, and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparels with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. Verse 11, and they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout and they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Hallelujah. They begin to shout. Did you see that? They got dressed up. Did you see that? They got dressed up. They got their garments out. They got their, their things out. They got their instruments out. They got their trumpets out. They got their cymbals out. And they went and they started blowing the trumpets. They started crashing the cymbals. They started shouting for joy. They started jumping and praising God because God had brought them from Babylon. And he brought them up here. And now the foundation of the temple is laid. They went from the rivers of Babylon, weeping and wailing, to now shouting beside the foundation foundation of the brand new temple that God was building. Hallelujah. It was something only God could do. This was something that only God could do. And they realized that these people were experiencing the working of God right before their eyes. This was something that only God could do for them. And God was doing a miracle in their life. They've gone from captivity now they're to construction, and they're building the house of the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. This place of worship is being restored. This place of joy, this place of sacrifice, this place of singing, this place of blessing, this place that they've been gone from for so long, now God has brought them home. It was the Lord that said to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord. The day they were looking at that, they were saying, yes, 
This is something that only God could do. (laughs) This is something that only God can do. When you see a life remade, this is something only God can do. When you see someone broken at the bottom, and then the joy comes, and the shouting comes, and the victory has come, you step back and you say, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And God begins to do miracles. That's what I'm looking for God to do. He built a building back then, but I believe that God can begin to transform life after life after life that is sitting in ruin, that is sitting in darkness, that is sitting in sorrow. God can begin to transform, and we'll step back and say, this is something that only God can do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I like it whether you like it or not. Not everyone responds the same way. Look at verses 12 and 13, and I'm going to be wrapped up. You're singing, praise the Lord. I'm about to get my song back. (laughs) Verses 12 and 13. But many of the priests and Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men, old ancient men, that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. There was a bunch of racket going on. And there were some people that were wailing because they were actually saddened by it. Really? But then there were others who were praising God, shouting for joy. The old men were looking at it and saying, how could this ever compare to Solomon's temple and the beauty that was there? And they wept because they had seen the beauty of that first temple. But then there were others who were the younger who had never seen anything but Babylon. And when they came and they found out that God had brought them there and they found out that God had planned all this and they found out that they could come to the altar and they found out that they could obey God and they could serve God and they could do something and they found out that God was making all this happen and then the foundation was laid and they're looking at it and they're saying, whoa! Look at what God did. Hallelujah. And the old men are like, that's nothing. You should have seen the old temple. You should have seen how they did it back then. They were throwing wet blankets on them is what they were doing. I have a desire in my heart someday to have a moment like this where we look back and they're shouting where we say this is something only God can do. And I pray that in this church we have no ancient men, but we have people that are shouting to say, look at what God is doing today. Don't be so preoccupied with what God has done in the past that you forget to praise him for what God is doing today. Don't be one of those that as the younger generation is coming up and the Lord willing, he begins to stir and begins to move and something begins to happen. Don't be one of those that say, well, you should have seen it in my day. You give him your wisdom. You give him your instruction. 
You give them the things that you've learned. You teach them. You grow them. You train them because there's a lot of wisdom in this room. And you raise them up so that when God begins to stir, that you've got some warriors in this house that are going to take the message of God around the world. You build those people. You build them up. You grow them. You invest into them because they're coming up right behind you. You be one of those that comes right along with them and you start crashing your own cymbal. You start blowing your own trumpet until you run out of air if you're real old. Shout with them. Praise God with them. Pray for God to move. Let God stir you. Have open ears and say, God, whatever you want to do, if you're doing something today, I want to be a part of it. If you're going to do something in my day, I want to be right there with it. It may be reaps of rubble. It may be piles of stuff that I got to waste through. It may be a long process, but if you're doing something today, God, I'm going with you. Hallelujah. I'm going with you. So what was the question? They said, how can this temple compare to the former? How can the glory of this temple you just laid possibly compare to Solomon's? Well, one day Jesus actually stepped into that temple, by the way. In the flesh, the Son of God walked into the temple, this temple that they wept and wailed over. But God stepped into it. The only problem was is they missed their day of visitation. But you and I have a reason to shout today. Because the altar's been built. The cross. The sacrifice has been made. The foundation has been laid. That is the foundation of Christ Jesus. The finished work, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is a foundation we can build upon. There's no other foundation we can build upon, and not only that, the finished work of Christ made it possible that we could be the temple of the Holy Ghost. Stephen said, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, and Christ has come to live in us. The Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. God is building his church. God is building his people. And he wants us to go out and find them. He wants us to go out and find the hard cases. He wants us to go out and find the people in ruin. He wants us to go out and find those people that have lost their song and say, you can sing again. He wants us to go out and find them and say, God is calling you home. Today's the day. And hopefully they don't say, I'm going to die. No. Someday. But God is calling you to come. God is calling you to come home. There's some, there some people that, that, are, that are maybe far away from God today. You've, you've, let, you've settled in Babylon, more or less. God's saying, come home. God's saying, come home. Brother Chris, bring a song tonight. God's saying, come home. It's time to go back to the Father's house. You know, at the Father's house, when the son came home, there was music and dancing. Music and dancing. What happened? He got his song back. There are some people today, you need to get your song back. You've lost it somewhere. But this message to you, God's calling you home. You can have it back. God's saying you can be restored. You can be healed. You can come home to music and dancing. You can come home to shouting and praising. And you'll stand back and say, this was something that only God can do. Praise God. Stand with me tonight. We're going to give an invitation. You can pray right where you are. Those that are joining us online tonight, right where you are, is a time where you can, God can hear you at home. Um, you know, right there, you can just have a conversation with them, and you can get your shout back right there in your house, and your neighbors will be wondering what in the world is going on next door.
Then you share the broadcast with them. Maybe you'll hear a shout next door. Make it a point to find some people that are in ruin. Find some people who are in tragedy, in difficulty. Find some people who need somebody to come and bring the light and say, I was there and God called me home. God restored and God did what only he could do. These altars are open tonight. We have a song.